for today, we're going to start out with the Surveyor 3 camera. This is the one, apparently, that was cut off Surveyor 3 with bolt cutters, or, and we notice that there's a cable hanging down here. All right. Now we notice there on this one here, these are all from Surveyor 3. On the middle picture, we see there's the cable coming down and tied to this strut. So the article claims that this is a safety tether because it's going around here and down around there, it's tethered off. Now on this same one, Surveyor 3, we have the same tether, only this time it's a wire and it's going into the back of this camera unit. Now when you look at the documents that we pulled up, this is to control the servo inside of this mechanism to control the tilt of the lens. This over here, this motor mechanism over here on the side, this helps to control the azimuth of the lens. And there's another motor inside of here that rotates another filter system with filter lenses on it to filter out whatever they want to filter out. The problem is that when you look at this very first image, where's the wire inside of this? Where's all the wires in this? Because I'm going to show you another video that shows the wires going up the outside of the cable when they're testing it. But how do you cut this so clean? This has been cut with a knife or an exacto, something very sharp. But how is this going to work when this over here is claiming to be a tether and it's tethered off to the ring on this strut? How can that work anything when there is supposed to be current and signals going up here to control the mirror inside of this? So we have three discrepancies here. Here's the cable, no wire. Over here, they claim it's a tether. And over here, the wire's going right into the backside of this. And then we'll take the schematic of the camera up here. There's the cable right here that's been cut. This is where they're claiming it's a tether because it's coming down here and then it's clamped off to this strut. Then you look over here and it's an actual wire going into the back to control everything. And then over here, we're back to a tether again because there's no wires inside of this. On the left is their model of it, and you can see the motor is attached to the mirror on the shaft so that it rotates the mirror. And inside, you can see the camera lens sitting there and right. part of it in the mirror as well. It's reflecting off the mirror, but the motor is attached directly to the shaft going to the mirror to make it rotate. The one on the right, the motor's not attached to it at all. It's just uh, a mock-up. And inside, there are more wires going through into the inside, but they're definitely not in the other image. Yeah. The working model that they had there on the left-hand side is one that they show off what's on the claimed lunar surface. And the mirror, of course, there is covered in dirt he swiped his finger on it, and it's the only spot where there's actually dirt on it whatsoever. If you pull up the schematic, you can see the whole, if you bring that up full size, you can see where the motor control and the relays are, and it's just a rope coming down there. That actually connects on the photographs from Apollo 12. That wraps around and connects from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. It doesn't come down as a tether. It's supposed to be an actual cable. I think when they were just making a mock-up, instead of using wire, they just used rope. When you zoom that in there, that cable goes down, wraps around the back, and comes up to where his hand is. It doesn't tie in down there. Then you take this one over here, and you look at this guy, and you can see that there's a ring, and it's just attached to this. It's tethered off. This comes around and goes around, and it goes right back up again, up this way. But what surveyor is that supposed to be? These are all Surveyor 3. I double-checked them. They're Surveyor 3, all of these. Well, we're going to look at something a little bit more interesting. We're going to look at the video. See this wire going down here? Well, I'm going to show you some other ones where there's just strands of wire going down here. So there's your wires. So let's put this over here, and let's just have another look 
at this one. Put this one up. And let's put this one up. There's something not matching here. No. It's three different models of it. The videos are all claiming to be from Surveyor 3. These, to me, look like Surveyor 3, 5, and 7's cameras when I go and look back because they're different cameras. They say this is Surveyor 3, this is Surveyor 3, this is Surveyor 3, and this is Surveyor 3. That's in the museum. Yeah, well, the motor on the right-hand side there that is connected and one and not connected in the photographs. It sits back from the mirror. It's not even on the pin to rotate it. So if you look at the different Surveyor cameras, that's Surveyor 7, yeah. the one with the motor sitting back further. But you can see the motor on the right-hand side of that one is connected to the mirror to rotate the mirror. And on the left-hand side, that's an actual wire coming up there, not just a tether. And that rotates the mirror around. You see this? There's your cam lock connector here. And then it just keeps traveling up there. And then it goes right into the side of the back of it. And you can see the wires inside there. Yes. And there's all your wires. Yeah. coming through then when you look at this you're going my god what's wrong with this situation here and then you come to this and it's a rope and let's double check that oh yeah it's the same picture all right so there it is there's the rope there's no wire inside of this so these bolt cutters they use to remove it from the surveyor lander are there any pictures of the bolt cutters being used no we couldn't find any they're only showing in the cue cards. There's the cable coming down around. It goes yeah. around behind it and actually attaches up at the base of this unit here on the right, the other motor at the top. And this cable here goes through and up to it. And you'll see it again there closer. <laughs> it's funny when you see a photograph and then you see that they've added more tape to it or whatever. <laughs> for whatever they're doing there, right? Just been added while they're taking the photographs, right? Right. Added um, was on the moon, hey? Right? Yeah, yeah. They had the moon maintenance guys are there. Yeah. You can still see it there in that photograph. It's right there. It goes around the back. It is not running as a tether. And this is as far around the back side that you can get of it wrapping around there, going up. And then it does get to the other side here when he gets his fingers on it. Now, this is interesting because when they're operating this little boom arm out here with the shovel on it, they have a cable controlled device to operate it up and down, and there's a shot of it laying there. There it is there. That cable runs down and out, and you can see that in other videos when they're actually operating that thing on Earth to practice with it. This cable's out running out like that. It's the only shot you see of it like that. Those are just the little quirks that are on this machine that should not be on this machine. You can see all the control wires going up this little cable going into this connector here, this little cam lock. You can see that there's wires there. So where are the wires inside of the cable on this one? So you can see it there, I see. Yeah, you'll be able to see the filters that run over the top. They show them rotating inside. If you go so, in that little video where it shows the antenna, calling it a planar device, that's supposed to be a planar antenna. And then that's what a planar antenna looks like. They are three-dimensionally in design, and they are directional. But the main thing is, is a planar antenna, to control it, you need a computer. Surveyor 3 does not have a computer on board. What the military used that particular shot of that particular machine there, that's 75 kilowatts for a distance of 250 miles. <laughs> Just so people know, because they keep telling me about communications and everything else. And it, all of these people that comment in there, we appreciate that you're commenting. If you think it can run with 20 watts to the moon, if you can do anything, take your knowledge. Take that basic knowledge that you are so convinced in that, and you go to a radio station that puts a 50,000 watts for a 100-mile radius on there, and you show them that they can save so much money 
if they only use just your 20 watts. And because it's only 100 miles, they only need a couple of watts, right? But they use 50,000 watts for a 100-mile radius, 160-kilometer range on the radius. That's the range that they're given with it. That's what they're licensed for, and they're limited to that amount of power. But all of these people, with all of their knowledge, they could solve all of these problems, communications on Earth, with their little 20 watts or 10 watts, whatever they think they how they're doing to get communications to the moon. Because you don't have to worry about radiation in the Van Allen belts, the plasma, the anything else on there. Nothing. You're simply on Earth and you can communicate everywhere. And with those 20 watts that you claim, you should be able to pick up a radio signal anywhere in the world. Yeah, but now when you look at the planar antennas, you can see that without those lobes that are integrated between parallel and series that are up on those panels individually, if it's a planar antenna, you have to have those lobes somewhere on that surveyor. I don't know about you, but I don't see any. And then show the one where it's just a desktop. But this camera really takes the cake when you have three cameras that these guys are claiming to be from the Surveyor 3, and they're clearly not from the Surveyor 3. They're from 3, 5, and 7. They're from different models on Earth because none of them were taken anywhere else. Let's have a good look at this planar antenna here. Piece of particle board. We've discussed this before. There it is. Looks quite convincing, doesn't it? This is probably the coffee counter that they cut off. They trimmed the edges off there because you're coming out of the washroom and there's your coffee counter and it's trimmed off for shape and they took it off and stuck it on this machine. Oh, we should see the other side of it because when you do get to the other side, there is not one A single bit of solar cell. That's the only shot. What do you see on there? See those solar cells? Nope. You've got a shot with solar cells on it, and you can actually see that they're solar cells. This has got some banding on it. it. might be duct tape or something that they've stuck on there. Or oh, pencil lines, sharpies. That's the only shot of the thing. If that's the solar panel and this is a planar antenna, they've got a whole brand new bit of technology. There's a little better shot of that. It's completely devoid. It's almost as if they've used the model that they had now that film you showed originally, Robert, had the background of the lunar surface, or alleged lunar surface, which were the photographs that we were shown when they were demonstrating the ability of the surveyor camera to photograph the lunar surface. They just laid them out behind the camera, because if they had photographed the surface, as they claimed to have done, and then they used the same photographs as the background to the surveyor camera, people would be convinced that what they were looking at was real. In fact, it was not. It was all done here on Earth under controlled conditions, as were most of them, because there's no evidence of any bolt cutter being used anywhere. There were knives, possibly, to cut the cable. That the, bolt cutter is not in their equipment list either. Oh, another thing. I Good found point. a movie. It was called Apollo 12, Pinpoint for Accuracy. I found a color photograph of the Surveyor 3. And it came from a Hasselblad camera, too. This sequence is all color until you get to the guy's helmet. Now it goes back to black and white. But there's the reticles. So it is from a Hasselblad camera, except they have color film in it. So how was that photograph taken? Was it from the lunar lander as it came into land? You can see the reticules on the ones that are the still images, right? There we go. Obviously, they just changed the film to color. Yeah, but there, you can clearly see the reticules on it. They're just taking the still images and putting it into this video. Yeah. Boy, and did you see the sun? I don't know if you noticed that in the helmet there. Look at this. Yeah. That's a big sun, isn't it? That's not a sun. That's a large spotlight. Precisely. But how would you get so many of these little reflections across <laughs> here? That's the felon lights they're using. Make sure the shadows don't get too dark. And now we're back to a big sun. Yeah. Big, big spotlight sun. again. Now we're back to small. Yeah, we've got lots of little fill-in lights there. And then, of course, you have more junk here. It's not a rock. 
And this scoop's going for it. You can see it looks like the scoop is going for whatever this is. I mean, there's a little post here. There's a post there. There's one here. I mean, you don't get rocks that are like this either. <laughs> oh, by the way, you want to see there's the desktop again. It hasn't changed. I don't see any lobes no. on it. No, that's a nice planar antenna. I just put the cue card in there with the bolt cutters. Oh, look. <laughs> That they're walking out, just the cartoon of it. They got a great big one. Two guys have to carry it. Oh, yeah, for the Vernier Engineering. So that's where they kept it. But why don't you see them using it? Ah, good question. Why don't you? Maybe both of them had to use it, and they had to set their cameras down. <laughs> Maybe the photographer had to help them, so they set the camera down. <laughs> it's getting worse. Yes, now it's getting worse. <laughs> Maybe the director, Jones, had to come over and help them. Oh, he's a busy so chap. couldn't now. film him. Wasn't Gynes the photographer? Yep. He's the one that added the extra duct tape to that rope. Well, somebody <laughs> had to do it. Well, you look at one picture, and the very next picture has got duct tape added to it. Yep. It's pretty interesting how they can do that. Give us a little rundown of this motor. That particular motor, the one on the left-hand side, you can actually see the motor is at the bottom of that housing, and it's running a gear set that rotates the mirror up and down depending on how it's rotated around whatever direction. And that's an actual television camera that's running in there, so it's not running film or anything. They've got it set so that it can take a still shot. They're just taking a frame shot of it as it's running out there. That's how they got the 11,000 photographs. Yeah, but if you notice the mount, the way the motor is mounted on the one on the right-hand side, it's lower to that pin. And then here, this is well, higher. This is actually in the, line with the pin. How is that going to rotate? It can't rotate the mirror because it's the pin that's making it turn. That's how it pivots. It's pinned through on both sides. The motor is attached to the one side right into the mirror so that when it turns, it moves the mirror. On the other side, it's just a cheap mock-up. You see the one on the left-hand side, you can actually see the casing of the motor and the housing of the motor is right there down at the bottom, the two different colors of it. The one on the other side is just white nothing with a cheap band to hold it in place there. And it's not even lined up. It's not attached to the mirror or anything. Oh, by the way, you see, you can see the reflection of this mirror. You could see the ground reflection in this. But over here, if you notice, it's all full of dust, and you cannot see the ground. That's the only dust on the entire machine. And, of yeah. course, the mirror is facing down on the angle, so the dust must have levitated up just to the mirror. But the rest of the machine is whistle clean. As a matter of fact, they must have washed it because there's still water laying on top. And we got that nice shot of them with the water laying on top there. But this is interesting because this one on the left side is actually in line with the pin, but the one on the right is not. The only way that this one could work is if there was a moon-shaped gear here and one down on the bottom so that they would go like this. That would work, but I don't see any gears well, down there. it's not there. connected. It has to connect to the pin somehow. Well, in any case, something's definitely wrong with this whole scenario here. It's all mocked up from the models that they had here on Earth, the photographs that they allegedly took on the moon, and descriptions that we can't confirm, but they can say whatever they like, to prove that the thing was on the moon. They don't show the bolt cutters that they used to remove it from the surveyor lander, and if they had, they would be very obvious because bolt cutters are not clean cut. And you've got this thing with bits of rope hanging off it, no wires where there should be wires, no bolt cutters where there should be bolt cutters. It's like a mock-up, just like the LEM is a mock-up. The LEM is a complete mock-up. I mean, there's no compression on the legs, nothing. Buzz Aldrin's right up against the door frame because there's literally nothing inside of that thing. They just yeah. needed the leg with the ladder coming down for it to sit there and the basic shape of it. And they didn't have to fill it in with much because they could just put the mylar right over it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So it's really easy to transport that around because there's basically the weight of that machine isn't there. 
all of the stuff that's supposed to be inside is not inside that model that you're seeing for them to climb down. It's what we've been saying for a long time, really, that the whole thing is a fabrication. It's a mock-up. Now what we need to do is pull up Neil deGrasse Tyson and listen to that minute and a half. Okay, let's have a look. Because the rocket did launch. We all saw the rocket launch. Now, did he actually say anything? No. No. Has he read the documents? No. No. Did he see the rocket take off? Yes. I think he was four years old or something when the rocket took off. He'd seen film of it. Let's put it that way. Let's be generous to him. Well, I watched him and the thing said he was four years old or something when the, the rocket took off. You know, and he said it impressed the pants off of him, and that's how he became an astrophysicist. And, of course, he was hanging around with Carl Sagan and stuff like that. He hasn't read the documents because if he's as educated as he tells everybody he is, he would very quickly see the anomalies in the documents. He would only see them if he was looking for them. But because he's looking for confirmation of what he thinks is real, he won't see the anomalies because he's not looking at it realistically. Blindfolded. But if he claims he's that intelligent, he should be able to just look at it objectively and see all of the inconsistencies in the documents. Yeah, of course. Quite right. When we point them out, I mean, there's no way that you cannot refuse to see them again when we point them out. When we point out that that computer can't function the way it needs to function to operate as a guidance system, that it simply didn't have the capabilities, just go to a dollar store and buy a calculator and set it on the table. If you can make that operate as a guidance system because that's all they had to work with, and by the way, the one you buy at the dollar store today is hundreds of thousands of times <laughs> more powerful than yeah. what their machines were. I mean, they're still running around with swipe cards, and people don't know what swipe cards are. 40, 50 guys running around in a room, 50, 60 tons of equipment sitting on the floor, and 400,000 amps all over the place to drive it, right? You got a 440 main trunk line coming into the building just to power the thing. And I mean, that must have been one hell of an expense to build all of that into an institution like that. And then, of course, within 10 years, you can actually do the same thing on a desktop. But it didn't happen in the 60s. We're into the mid 1980s before you got a desktop computer that was even viable. The other models out there did nothing, but they were very specific in what they could do programming with because you didn't have uh, random access memory. You had read-only memory in the 1960s. That was on a wire core. I mean, you got 16 kilobits of information on a four-pound block. <laughs> <laughs> kilobits, not kilobytes, kilobits. And it would take 30 to 40 seconds for that to load. 16 kilobits. People just don't understand that. That's like one little paragraph of information. And that's all it could store. And then you had to hold a button and let it reset until it discharges before you could load the next one. People think this was operating a guidance system or anything else. Crazy. It could not receive the information. That's the problem. It's pre-programmed. You might as well take a jukebox and let it play records for you while you're going. Because you can't put the information back in there. And people say, oh, well, they just sent a signal, oh, they upgraded the signal, or they did this and they did that. Did not happen. That's why they still had a room for the 40 guys sitting in there with slide rules to do the calculations when they're so-called out there on a sextant reading the stars. Slide rules were very important to NASA around the mid-60s, because that's all they had available to use. I think most of the people listening would have to look up to find out what a slide rule is. It simply were full generations away from that kind of stuff. Remember we were oh. talking about the degrees of the triangles? We can show our audience. Why are you looking for that, Scott? There's something I want to comment on about Neil deGrasse Tyson. He makes this big thing about all the scientific calculations that were done and how everybody would create those. And he says, well, why would they do it if they were faking it? Something along those lines. The point is that one of the major points raised by many people is there were 400,000 people working on the Apollo program right across America. Yeah. They were the people who were creating all these scientific documents. 
And they were doing it quite legitimately, believing that what they were doing was legitimate scientific information. They had no reason to believe it wasn't. So the idea that they weren't creating it is nonsense. Of course they were creating it. They were creating all the scientific information they could think of to be necessary to land a man on the moon. They didn't know they weren't going to do it because nobody had told them they weren't going to do it. They were genuinely believing it was going to happen. And they see the rocket taking off and they think, oh, look, they're going to the moon. And the only way they know they're going to the moon is because NASA tells them that they're going to the moon. So all the work that they were doing is going to be legitimized. And those great stacks of computer printouts we see, sort of standing about five or six feet high, they were quite legitimate. Of course they were. They were printouts from basic mainframe computers. But not everybody knew. In fact, very few of the 400,000 people knew that it wasn't going to happen the way we had been told. Because how would they be informed? How would these 400,000 people be informed it was a fake? They hadn't invented email at that point, so it would be a memo or a letter. 400,000 letters going around? Come on, guys, you know, get real with your excuses. The 400,000 people who worked on Apollo, they were genuine, they were quite real. And they had friends, they had wives, they had husbands, they had family. So there were probably two million people involved altogether, directly involved. Of course you can't keep a secret from two million people. You can keep a secret if you're only about 30 or 40 people involved. And they are working on national security and they know that if they break ranks, they're going to land up six feet under. So let's get real about the excuses, shall we? That is what people need to understand. You're just working in a factory and you get a contract. Exactly. And that might not be your only contract. Like, well, look at Goodyear. They're making rubber tires all the time. OK, well, let's build one for the rover. So there's no rubber in them. OK, <laughs> so they team up. They put a little Skunk Works team on there with NASA and they build these wireframe mesh units with titanium loops in them. And yep. they figure out how much weight they're going to carry. And they sit there and they build a machine so they can weave this thing in so that it's a, a circle pattern that it can fit on a rim. That's all they did. And of course, they couldn't figure out how to get the titanium treads on them, the little chevron treads that were on the thing. So they had to rivet them on because in 1969, they didn't know how to weld titanium. It was into the mid 70s before they figured out how to successfully weld titanium. Yeah. So then when you read back through all the documents and realize that, oh, well, they got titanium fuel tanks, so they're lighter weight. They got titanium this. Oh, the exhaust nozzle on the thrusters. Oh, they're all titanium. No, they're not. And okay. here's this calculator. So you come down to here and let's say we're going to take the flagpole. Right. So on this side will be your vertical line. So it's 90 degrees straight up. The flagpole's eight feet high. And this is your degree angle here. Actually, when they took the photographs of it, it would be in the 14 degrees because when they landed, it was at 14. When they took off, it was 15. By the time they put the flag up, it might be 14 to 14, whatever, right? So you come up here. Here's the degree angle <laughs> of the shadow is 32 feet. If you see 11 or 12 feet in any of the photographs, you'd be lucky to do that. That's just that 14 degrees. Yeah. So if I put, say, 36 degrees in there, which I figure the sun angle is on the thing, you've got 11 feet. That's about right. Yeah. So it could be 35 degrees. It could be 34 degrees yeah. in that angle. If I put in 34 degrees here, then you're going to come up at 11, 8. Yeah, that's about right. That's about what it is. So that's about what it is, just on that. So yeah. now the astronaut's going to be six feet high. So if we put six feet in here, then you've got eight foot eight. That's the shadow length. Just slightly longer than the astronaut. Right. The height of the lamb sitting there is 24 feet approximately, right? So you pull it up there at 34 degrees, the shadow is 35 and a half feet long. However, if you pull it back when they landed in all those beautiful photographs they took out there at 24 feet at 14 degrees and you put it in there, it's 96.2 <laughs> feet long. Now, we don't see that shadow length anywhere in any of those photographs. No, we don't. No. And this is what people need to realize. 
They could have changed the angle of their lighting when they're shooting the shots. It might be up and down five or six degrees on some of their angles. You know, if they're using a little artistic license in their shooting to get the best shots out there. But we do not see these shadow lengths on anything. It's yeah. as simple as that. 